Christ's birth made night as bright as day. When Jesus spoke, the truth was known. When Jesus walked, the way was shown. When Jesus died, all death was slain. When Jesus rose, was life's refrain. Hallelujah, Christ is coming, Lord. We wait for you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Friday of the third week of Easter. And also today is the Feast of St. Louis Marie de Montfort. And um, Louis Marie de Montfort is the one responsible for the consecration uh, to Jesus through Mary. And his book, True Devotion, which is an absolute classic of the spiritual life. And much of um, his thinking about Mary is really reflected in Lumen Gentium, uh, in the Second Vatican Council document on the church. And his thinking is pretty much uh, the mind of Lumen Gentium. And uh, so we pray through his intercession because I think he's an important player. And probably much in the Western church, uh, most Marian theology really comes from de Montfort. And um, also I want you to really pay attention to the first reading because we're going to zoom into the first reading here today as well. Let's begin in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And let's ask God for his wonderful and tender and beautiful mercy. Lord Jesus, you are mighty God and Prince of Peace, Lord, have mercy. Your Son of God and Son of Mary, Christ, have mercy. Your Word made flesh and splendor of the Father, Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, who made the priest St. Louis an outstanding witness and teacher of total devotion to Jesus, your Son, through the hands of the Blessed Mother, grant us that following the same spiritual path, we may constantly spread your kingdom through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Saul, still breathing murderous threats against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, that if he should find any men or women who belonged to the way, he might bring them back in Jerusalem in chains. On his journey, as he was nearing Damascus, a light from the sky suddenly flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, Who are you, sir? The reply came, 
I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless for they heard the voice but could see no one. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. For three days he was unable to see, and he neither ate nor drank. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and ask at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is there praying, and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, that he may regain his sight. But Ananias replied, Lord, I've heard from many sources about this man, what evil things he has done to your holy ones in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to imprison all who will call upon your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for this man is chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. I will show him what he will have to suffer for my name. So Ananias went and entered the house, laying his hands on him, he said, Saul, my brother, the Lord has sent me. Jesus, who appeared to you on the way by which you came, that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, things like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. He got up and was baptized, and when he had eaten, he had recovered his strength. He stayed some days with the disciples in Damascus, and he began at once to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. The Word of the Lord. Praise the Lord, all you nations, glorify him, all you peoples, for steadfast kindness and his Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say it to you. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, my blood true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and died, whoever eats his bread will live forever. These things he said while teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. What a powerful gospel. What a powerful first reading. And I want to talk about the first reading today especially. But both of them, powerful, powerful readings for us to ponder. So in the first reading here, one of the great stories of all of scriptures, uh, um, the strange story about Saul or Paul. Paul, his Gentile name. Saul, his Jewish name. 
who was dedicated to stamping out uh, this band of disciples of Jesus, the people of the way, as they were called in those days, dragging Christians from their homes, joining in Stephen's murder, on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians. And then comes the drama on the road to Damascus. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you? Good question. I'm Jesus who you are persecuting. Then he tells him to go off to Damascus and Ananias will come to him, which there's a little bit of the image of Ananias coming to him. Another very important part of the story because Ananias is the one who baptizes Paul. But let me go on with, let me, let me use our imagination together. Let's go on with the, the dialogue a little bit if we could. Now imagine, now the dialogue stops there, but imagine if it went on to say something like this. Paul says, wait a minute, you're dead. Jesus had been dead for maybe five, six years at this point. I'm persecuting these people who are your followers. I'm not persecuting you. What does that mean? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you? I'm Jesus of Nazareth who you are persecuting. And again, if we use our imagination, wait a minute, I'm not persecuting you. I'm persecuting your followers. Hmm, really? So what's going on here? Two things. Number one. Great story of Paul's conversion. Paul mentions it three times in the Acts of the Apostles. He mentions it again in his letter to the Galatians. It is very moving, a very, very powerful, a very important story. But here is the second part, which I want to zoom into here now. Why are you persecuting me? You're dead. I'm persecuting your church. What Jesus is saying to Saul and saying to all of us is that he and the church are one. To persecute the church is to persecute Jesus. We become one with Jesus by our baptism. One of the great baptismal verses in all the scriptures is Galatians chapter 3, starting with verse 26. For through faith you were all sons of God, like Jesus. Uh, he's a son of the Father. We become a son or a daughter of the Father. It says sons there. Because this firstborn son was the only one who received the inheritance. So Paul is not misogynist by saying son there. He's simply saying all of us now are like firstborn sons. He goes on. For all of you who are baptized into Christ, you become Christ, and clothe yourself with him. That's a reference to an actor. When they take the, uh, the clothes of the part on, they become the part. We are supposed to become Christ. Then he goes on to say this beautiful line, no longer Jew or Greek, they hated each other. No longer slave or free person. No longer male or female. Women have been struggling for equality from the beginning of time. You are all now one in Christ Jesus. All those divisions are gone. Listen to this quote from the Catechism, by the way. This is paragraph 795. It's a quote in the Catechism about Jesus and his church that so we're talking about here. It's a quote about St. Augustine that writes this. He says, let us rejoice then and give thanks that we have become not only Christians, but we have become Christ himself. Do you understand and grasp, brothers and sisters, God's grace toward us? Marvel and rejoice. We have become Christ. For he is the head. We are the members. He and we together, the whole man. The fullness of Christ then is the head and members. But what does head and members mean? Christ and his church. To persecute Christ, to persecute the church, excuse me, is to persecute Christ. Do you understand the deep intimacy that we have with Jesus? And he, as part of the church, he's the head, says Paul in, the Colossi in, in, in Colossians. He's the head of his body, which is the church. The church will look awful strange without the head. And the church will look awful strange without the body. We need both together, all of us together as one. So my question is for you here today. How do you see your baptism? Can you see more clearly how you are baptized into Christ? Can you see how now you and I are Christ? God bless you, brothers and sisters. Looking forward to seeing you this weekend. Uh, Good Shepherd Sunday, where we talk about uh, Jesus being that Good Shepherd, another label, or another image that we use to make sense of who Jesus is. So thank you very much for watching. Looking, to for looking forward to seeing you this weekend. Goodbye now.